Well, I'm glad to be here, and uh, I guess the first topic we're discussing is presentation. And I would say that, you know, my first goal is not to win people over to my side. That's ultimately a goal of mine, but it's not my first goal. Jesus did not win most people over to his side. I, my first goal is to present the truth and to be biblical. And lots of times you won't win people over doing that. Uh, but preaching publicly, you know, preaching is not handing out tracts. It's not feeding the poor. It's not witnessing one-on-one. -on -one, it's not inviting people to church. All that's biblical, and I'm not against it, but it's not preaching. Preaching is always an outdoor public proclamation of truth. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 27, What I tell you in darkness, speak ye in light, what you hear in the ear, preach upon the housetops. Jesus said in Mark 16, 15, Go into all the world and preach the gospel. And you know, a lot of people think that, well, the gospel is good news. And if you're a condemned sinner that realizes you deserve hell, then it is good news. But lots of times what the Bible calls the gospel would not necessarily be considered good news to most of the world that's living in rebellion against God. Revelation 14, 6 and 7 says the everlasting gospel. And then it says, fear God, give glory to Him for the hour of His judgment is come. According to the Bible, that's the everlasting gospel. Mark chapter 1, verse 1 through 4 says, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Then it says in verse 4, John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Point I'm trying to make in that passage Mark 1, 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it starts out with John the Baptist preaching the message of repentance. The gospel starts out with repentance. Preaching is an outdoor public proclamation of truth done in a high-handed, heavy-handed, officious, meddlesome manner, offering one's services whether not asked for, wanted, or appreciated. Now there's something about going out and meeting the sinner on his common ground in the public forum and confronting him with the truth about God and his condition before God. Most of the people we're reaching would never voluntarily read a tract or attend a church service. Titus 1.3 says that God has in due times manifested or revealed his word through preaching. 1 Corinthians 1.21 said it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Yes, Paul said preaching is going to look foolish to the world, but it's God's method for saving sinners. What are we supposed to be preaching? Luke chapter 24, verse 47, Jesus told us. And lots of times we preach everything but this. And this is not the only thing we're supposed to preach, but it's something that America desperately needs and something that's often neglected. Jesus told his disciples uh, that Luke 24, 47, that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. In America, most people do not preach repentance. They preach remission of sins without preaching repentance. But without repentance, there is no remission of sins. Uh, over and over, everybody in the Bible preached repentance. M Matthew chapter 3, verse 1, uh, verse, uh, three, uh, Matthew chapter 3, verse 1 and 2 said, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, Jesus said, uh, the time is, uh, Jesus said, from that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Luke 13, 3 and 5, Jesus said, Except you repent, you will all likewise perish. Mark 1, 15, Jesus said, The time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. We got John the Baptist, we got Jesus. Peter said, Mark, uh, Acts 2, 38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Paul preached repentance. Acts 17.30 God now commands all men everywhere to repent because He's appointed a day in which He'll judge the world in righteousness. Uh, the disciples preached that men ought to repent. Acts Mark, Mark, Mark 6.12 So they went out and preached that men should repent. And they cast out many devils and anointed all men that were sick and they healed them. Uh, now we're, preaching means lifting up your voice. Uh, Acts chapter 2 verse 14 says on the day of Pentecost, Peter lifted up his voice. Isaiah 58 1 said, cry loud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet. Show my people their transgressions 
and the house of Jacob their sins. Uh, number two, we're supposed to preach the word, not only the gospel. There's a lot of things in the word of God that are not the gospel only. Uh, 2 Timothy 4, 2 says, preach the word. The instant in season out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Uh, we're supposed to preach the law. First Timothy, you know, we live in a society where we think that a sin the Bible calls, that's it? Okay. First of all, I'd like to thank you, Micah, for coming out. Thank you, Alex, for doing this. And thank all of y'all for coming. I uh, am you not going to be like Micah. You're going to see that from the very beginning. You know, we've all been, most of you in this room, have been exposed to Micah's preaching and uh, his method for preaching, correct? And you, some of you probably haven't even heard, most of you haven't even heard me preach, so you're not going to hear me doing all that. And many of you have been exposed to your own pastors. But you know, what I want to know, and what I thought about all week long as I was preparing for this, is what does God say about preaching? What's the method that God wants us to preach? That's important. So what we're going to do is we're going to, in my little section here, look at what the Bible says about preaching. How do we know if His way or my way is right? Or whether there's another way altogether. Acts 17.11 talks about a group from Berea. It's, these people were special because they studied the Bible to find out what Paul had said was so. That would be my challenge to you. Study the Bible to find out if what he's doing is right or what I'm doing is right. That would be my biggest challenge for you. They studied with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were true. If Micah, if nothing else, Micah's method has provoked me to study the Word of God more, to find out what is the right way to do this. So he mentioned 2 Timothy 4. He said, it says, the Bible, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and by His appearing and His kingdom, preach the Word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. This gives us a good outline. The Bible itself tells us how we're supposed to preach. That passage itself tells us how we're supposed to preach. It says, preach the Word. Like he said, the object is what? The Word. The Bible. Not our opinion. The Bible. And it's not the Bible with my take on it. It doesn't matter what I think what the Word says. I had some great conversations with y'all and y'all brought up some of the things that he was saying and you've come, you might even come to me and said, hey, do you think that he's right with this? Is it right? Is it fair? Well, sometimes in my mind it doesn't always seem fair. But it really doesn't matter what I think or what he thinks. It's what the Word says. If the Bible says this, we have to stand with it. And that's very important. It says reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. He mentioned this word reprove. It means to strictly appraise someone, warn them strongly, admonish someone. So he does that, right? Or does he? Well, I would suggest to you that there's a right way. You can do this with a strong voice. Or a gentle voice. You can do this in a soft way or a stern way. For example, did you know I can preach the word to my son? When I preach the word to my son, I can rebuke him. And when I rebuke him, I can talk just like this. See, <coughs> folks, if you get nothing else, listen to me. It's not about yelling at people, it's not about calling them names. About preaching the Bible. In 2 Timothy 2.24, it says this, The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth. Question. 
does that describe the way that he preaches on campus? Not quarrelsome? Not quarrelsome? Argumentative? Calling people names? 2 Timothy 2.24 is in the same context as 2 Timothy 4. I say this with all gentleness to Micah, too. This has to stop. It's giving a black eye to what Christ is all about. Christ didn't talk like this to people. Christ didn't call people names. You say, okay, well, what about when he called the Pharisees? Yeah, he called the Pharisees names. The Pharisees he called names were self-righteous. The sinner, he met on their spot. He loved them. He genuinely, graciously proclaimed the truth. Thanks. Okay, uh, as, I, as I clarified, uh, talking to your son one-on-one -on -one is not what the Bible calls preaching. Uh, look it up in Hebrew, Greek, or English. It always means a public proclamation of truth. Matthew 10, 27, what you hear in the ear, preach upon the housetops. Uh, calling names. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew 23, 33, he said, you serpents, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? Uh, Acts 7.51, Stephen said, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do you. Acts 13.10, Paul. Paul was not preaching to uh, what we would call Jews. He was talking to Simon the sorcerer. He said, O full, o full of all subtlety and mischief, Thou enemy of all righteousness, thou child of the devil, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? Jesus said in John 8, 44, You are of your father the devil. Now, you know, it's not because the people were religious that Jesus was sharp with them. The reason why Jesus was sharp with them was because of their pride. Uh, Israel was very religious. Uh, the Jews were a very religious people. Uh, if you committed adultery in Egypt, you were stoned. Now, in our society, we live in a society where the Bible calls homosexuality an abomination. And a lot of you in this room and most of your fellow students on this campus don't even think it's a sin. You don't even think it's a choice. Uh, but we are not going to show people what sin is unless we preach the law of God. Uh, <clears throat> so, Jesus called names. John the Baptist called names. He said, you brood of vipers. Who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? He called them a bunch of snakes. Now, I'm going to tell you, when you confront people, he said that uh, these the Pharisees were proud. Psalm 10.4 says, The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. Why doesn't the wicked man seek after God? The Bible said the reason why the wicked man doesn't seek after God is because of his pride. Obadiah 1.3 says, The pride of your heart has deceived you. Jeremiah 9.6 says, Thine habitation is in the midst of deceit. Through deceit they refuse to know me. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10 through 12 says, With all deceivableness of unrighteousness, and then that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So we have, we're living in a society full of arrogant, proud people who think that they are too good to go to hell. They think that they are too good for God to send them to hell. And we've got to destroy their pride. Uh, the Bible said in Psalm 36, 1 and 2, The transgression of the wicked says within my heart that there is no fear of God before his eyes. For he flatters himself in his own eyes until his iniquity be found to be hateful. Why does a wicked man flatter himself in his own eyes? The Bible says because he has no fear of God. 
Why is there no fear of God? Pro Proverbs 28.14 says, Happy is the man that fears always, but he that hards his heart shall fall into mischief. The Bible contrasts the fear of God with hardness of heart. Why is our society so arrogant and proud and obstinate toward a holy God? I'll tell you why, because there's no fear of God. You know why there's no fear of God? Uh, because people don't believe that their sin will cause a holy God to send them to hell. You know, you're loving, compassionate, all-accepting, all-tolerant. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 28, Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him who after he's killed body and soul has a power to cast into hell. Uh, the fear of God starts with realizing that your sin will cause a holy God to send you to hell. Proverbs 8.13 says the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Men will never depart from sin until they hate sin. And they'll never hate sin until they fear God. And they'll never fear God until they realize that a holy God will send them to hell for their sinning. Proverbs 16.6 6 says, By mercy and truth iniquity is purged, and by the fear of the Lord men depart from evil. Proverbs 14.7 says, the, 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 the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. Revelation 3.19, Jesus said, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent. The Bible said that God shows His love for hell-bound sinners that are going to hell by rebuking them in their sin and urging them to repent. Proverbs 27.5 says, Open rebuke is better than secret love. <clears throat> He mentioned at the beginning that uh, I wouldn't preach to my son and that's not what the word is. Well, my son is in my congregation every Sunday and I don't scream at him and yell at him and call him names. Even though my son is not regenerate right now. He has not believed in Christ yet. All three of my sons haven't trusted in him yet. Uh, Lord willing, they will soon. But I don't yell at my sons from the pulpit either and call them liars, cheats, stealers, things like that. There's a place for me to talk to them and gently call them to repentance. He mentioned also that Pharisees were... Uh, Actually, the problem was pride. Well, isn't that very much like self-righteousness, or isn't that the same thing? And the self-righteous, the ones that were called snakes and vipers and all those things, are ultimately what? The Pharisees. Who were the Pharisees? The Pharisees were the ones that walked around and said, Hey, I'm clean. I'm perfect. I've got it all figured out. I'm better than you. It wasn't the woman at the well. Remember the story of the woman at the well? Read John chapter 4. Write that down in your notes. Read it. How did he approach her? Very gently. Very kindly. Now, I am not saying don't speak about sin. Give me a break. If you preach the Word, you're going to talk about sin. I'm convicted even in my study for this. Just to get ready for this message. As I was thinking on these passages of being compassionate like Jesus and proclaiming the truth with gentleness and the way that Paul calls us constantly to be this way, and God's Word does, I was convicted. So look, folks. The self-righteous he called names. Prideful, yes. But the homosexual, look. I'm going to tell you, I had a great conversation with a young man after Micah blasted the homosexuals the other day. He came up to me and says, what's the Greek say about this word homosexual? And I showed him. And I said, man, I know. This ain't easy to hear. But I want to tell you, you can be delivered. You can have hope. You can have peace with God. And he looked at me when I finished talking to him about the truth of what the Scripture says. And he said, thank you. It's the first time somebody said that that's how I am, but God can deliver me and give me hope. 
ladies and gentlemen, we do talk about truth. We do call them the truth. And what does the Bible say? We do it in a compassionate and gracious way. Jesus does have stern rebukes and mention. Listen to this one. Matthew 23, 12. Whoever exalts himself shall be humbled, and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you shut off the kingdom of heaven for people. For you do not <laughs> enter in yourselves, nor do you allow those who enter to go in. What's he saying? He's saying literally, you walk around and make it impossible to get into heaven. Because you're self-righteousness. You think you're all this. He says, woe to you. And he does call them that way. Does anybody see any irony here in this whole thing? Am I the only one? Hopefully you see the irony in this. The self-righteous, one who calls himself perfect, is telling us what? We're going to hell. Now, I want to tell you, we're going to get into the gospel a little bit. I'm going to tell you, there's people here. I know that y'all, there's got to be people here that don't know Christ. I have good news for you, and it is the gospel. I challenge you to listen to the message and be aware of one thing. Having a bunch of scripture memorized doesn't mean you know it. Those same Pharisees had the first five books of the Bible memorized, ladies and gentlemen. Memorized. Guarantee you, people can memorize lots of scripture. Now that doesn't mean, I'm not saying here, don't go home and memorize because I want you to memorize. I was convicted. I need to do more of it. But, but, memorize scripture doesn't mean you got it. It's going to be weird because you got to ask questions. So you want me to answer? Oh, well, okay. Right? You're asking me questions first? That's fine. You want to stay? It does. We can sit here and you stand Matt, there. You don't matter to me. Is he supposed to ask me first? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, because we rotated. Okay. Yes. You got to ask me the question. Yes. Okay. Mike, have you ever opened air preached? Yes. Okay. We're at? On campus. <laughs> And, the and also on of, campus a little bit. I also did it over at uh, Ybor City a okay. little bit. Did you get a crowd? Uh, no, I didn't get much of a crowd, I have to admit. Okay. Didn't get much of a crowd. Is it effective if you don't get a crowd? Does it affect me? Is it, I said, is it, a, don't be so defensive. Is it um, effective sorry. if you don't get a crowd? Is it sorry. effective to preach the birds and the squirrels? Okay. okay. So, is it effective to preach to a small group? Absolutely. No, no, no. It's not what I asked you. Okay, it's a so question. Is it effective if you don't preach to anybody? Well, no, if there's no one there. Okay. Did you never had that did problem. You, did you get a crowd? Huh? Did I've had group? times did where, you get, yeah. Did you get a crowd? Yes, I've had some real good discussions. There's some guys here okay. that were atheists that have had good conversations. I'm talking about public preaching, not one-on-one -on -one conversation. But it starts with that. What's that? Well, yeah, I would talk like yeah, this, and they would come up and start asking me questions, and I was able to have some really good conversations with them. Okay, I agree with that. How would you define effective? How would I define as effective? Mm -hmm. uh, staying clear with the method presented by God in His Word, staying biblical, which we have seen what that is and how Jesus did it, and being accurate to the truth. Okay. That's effective. If you're accurate to the truth, is the world going to hate you? Yes. Okay. Yes. Now wait. Can I further that? Yeah, they're going to hate me. Okay. Okay. But I, they won't want to punch me necessarily. <laughs> why, why, did they, why did they nail Jesus to a cross? Okay. I, I understand can you, quote, can you quote John 7-7? Seven, seven? If you can't, I will. Go ahead. Jesus said in John 7-7, seven, seven, the world cannot hate you. But me it hates, because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. And he said in John 15, 18, and 19, If the world hate you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world will love his own, but because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Okay. So why does this campus hate you? 
Well, I would venture to say if they hung out with me long enough, if they weren't repentant and they didn't trust in Christ, you will come to a place where you hate me. I promise. Why? Because we're going to have to deal with sin. Okay? But I'm not going to beat you over the head with a two-by-four. I'm going to talk to you in a kind and gentle way and tell you what the Bible says. Okay? Okay, what's the, what's the definition of preach? The definition of preach is to speak forth. Caruso. Okay, is that one-on-one? -on -one? I, I would say that that is a from a, pul uh, a pulpit, and I would suggest that a lot of times was when he's talking preaching, in there, Was most preaching in the New Testament done from behind a pulpit? I would, it, there wasn't a pulpit, obviously. Right. There wasn't a indoor, thing. okay, indoors or outdoors. But I would suggest that it was to a crowd of a church. Indoors or outdoors. Sermon on the Mount. I, I would agree that the Sermon on the Mount was on the Sermon on the Mount. Okay, Acts 17. <laughs> Acts 17. Uh, huh? Mars Hill. Okay. Indoors or outdoors. Okay, it was outdoors. But okay. if you want me to tell you about this, now what happens is, is I'm not saying that if you're outside you shouldn't raise your voice. I'm going to raise my voice. Well, I was wondering how you you say you don't scream at people. How do you speak to large okay. numbers of people, which I guess you don't have any experience with because you never got a large crowd. How do you speak to large numbers of people? How do you speak to large numbers? He's been doing it all, all night. I haven't done it at all. Okay, but, but, but I'm just... That's listen. right. No, that's all right. That's, that's fine. You've been doing it all night. I'm not... That's fine. I'm saying what the Bible says. That's fine. How do you speak to several hundred students without lifting your voice? And you I'm raise your voice. Okay, now li listen to me. You raise your voice, okay. but you don't do this. Homo! <laughs> Sissy! Coward! You don't do that. Don't forget you do more. This. You don't do this. You do this. You've all sinned. You all need a Savior. Jesus is the one that came. You must repent and believe. Now that was very short. But that gets the gist. I think it, is this time up? Fifteen seconds. Make it the last statement. It's you. You. Last statement. Fifteen seconds. No, I'm nothing. Okay. Get up and say that after you're making all these personal attacks. Doesn't care a whole lot. But go ahead. I, that's fine. I'm not. I'm used to it. That's fine. Oh. Is there any? Listen. Hey, if you're not going to treat me with more respect, I'm not going to come back here again. <laughs> I got to teach you back. All right. All right. Listen up. Is there any record in the Bible that Jesus ever called someone a whore? No, if you were a whore in the Bible, you were stoned to death in, in Israel. Okay. So there would be no whores running around. Okay. Well, actually, uh, if you were a homosexual in ancient Israel, you'd be stoned to death. So there wasn't a bunch of homosexuals running around. Okay. Romans chapter 1 does address homosexuality. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 and 10 does. Uh, Ephesians, thir uh, Ephesians 5, 5 says, For this you know that... Listen... He asked me a question. Here, here we go. The whole Bible is the Word of God. Jesus is God. So all of this is inspired by God. If it's in here, then Jesus said it. Ephesians 5.5 5 says, For this you know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, which is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Hebrews 13.4 says, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Right. A whoremonger is a male fornicator. The female question. counterpart of a whoremonger is a whore. Can I ask another question? Yes. Did Jesus ever call anybody a coward, sissy, or a coward or a sissy? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10, which is inspired by God, and Jesus is God, says, Know ye not that the unrighteous 
shall not inherit the kingdom of God, be not deceived. Neither fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate. That means effeminate men will not inherit the kingdom of God. Revelation 21.8. Wait, 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 wait. Revelation. Let me, let me just ask a question. I said, let me say it again. Let me review. Did Jesus ever call anybody a coward or a sister? I'm getting to the coward now. Uh, Answer the question. The He's asking did. you, did Jesus? I, 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 just, I just did. I just did. Uh, Revelation chapter 21 verse 8 says this. But the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars will have their part in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. So, the first on the list was fearful. That means cowardly. Okay. So, you say that um, if... For example, yesterday we had a guy that was, I was watching you, and you called him a coward. And the context wasn't to tell him that he's going to hell, and that it was leading him to hell. It was just to call him a coward because he was leaving. That's okay to do? Yeah, a, a real man stands up and defends what he believes when they make a statement. They don't just say something and then walk away. Okay. Yes. You're going to stand up and say it, you defend it. Okay. Um, how does that work with bless those who persecute you and bless and do not curse? Well, Jesus said in, in Revelation 3.19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. He says, that, therefore, and repent. How does that work with do not overcome, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good? Oh, the Bible, the Bible says in Titus 1.13, wherefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Who is he talking to? The verse before that says, the Christians are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply, okay. that they may be sound in the faith. We had a guy that was from Britain yesterday, and you get got in a verbal argument with him and a discussion. Um, how does that fit in with 2 Timothy 2.24? The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome. Quarrelsome means to get in a word battle, dispute, or... Contention is what the lexicons say. Well, all over the book of Revel uh, the book of Acts, excuse me, chapters ten through twenty, we see Paul repeatedly disputing, contending, contending, arguing, debating, over and over again. Jude chapter was only one chapter. Jude verse three says, "Contend earnestly for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints." Proverbs twenty eight four said, "They that forsake the law praise the wicked, but such as keep the law contend with them." So those people that keep the law of God, that obey God, are supposed to contend with those that forsake the law. Do you practice some kind of theatrics and do this to get people to come and sit? You told me that... John Wesley said, they asked him, how do you get people to come out and listen to you? He said, I set myself on fire and they come out and watch me burn. Uh, <laughs> But you're not setting yourself on fire, you're setting others on fire. Uh, I'm on fire for God when I'm out there. Okay. Did Jesus ever try to get a crowd together by calling them names? Did Jesus ever try to get a crowd together by calling them names? Uh, well, how do you know I try to get a crowd by calling people names? Because in your interview several times you said that that's exactly what it does. And that's what you wanted. You're okay, give me an exact quote. Exact quote is from your interview with the University of Alabama newspaper where you said... Oh, uh, listen, listen. You cannot <laughs> trust a school newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's on YouTube. It's on YouTube. Uh, with Alabama? Yeah, the guy at Alabama. I watched the interview. It's, it's with the thing. Oh, See? not Alabama. I was never interviewed at Alabama on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's Ole Miss. It's an Ole Miss. How are we doing on time? Uh, Does your did, now here's they, they the topper. The, well, listen. that doesn't go along with what Jesus said. Hold on, let's keep going on our format. <coughs> Does Does your method provoke people to laugh and cheer at their own sin? Yes, the Bible says in First Corinthians one twenty one, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Yes. The Bible says over and over again that preaching is going to look foolish to the world. 
But it's God's method for saving souls. So if we believe in a holy God, which we do because the Bible says He's holy and just, You're what do we do with Isaiah 6 when Isaiah saw the Lord in His holiness and knew about His people being defrauded with sin and he goes, woe is me. You're laughing and creating laughter on the campus about sin. <laughs> You have the opposite going for what you Proverbs says fool, Proverbs says fools make a mock of sin. And you don't confront them on their sin. You don't confront what's in their heart and expose it in their heart. That's why you don't get the response. Yesterday, you know how out of touch you are? Yesterday, you asked a group of students. And you said, let me ask you a question. Do you guys think that the earth, the world, is getting better or better or worse and worse? And everybody in the group with a straight face looked at him and said, oh, the world's getting better and better all the time. And you were shocked. You know why, Mike? Because you're out of touch. You don't know what's in these students' hearts. Thank you. All right, so now we got to switch. You want to go ahead? Now we're going to uh, introduce the second topic. I will ask that we try and keep audience interaction to a minimum. Um, and uh, now we're going to talk about how one attains salvation. And it's going to be the same format as the last topic. Thanks. I started this time, right? Again, if I've offended you, I do ask for you to forgive me. No, I forgive you. I'm not offended. I just thought we were here to discuss what the Bible says, not the personal facts. How is someone saved? The term saved needs to be defined. What is that? That's short for salvation. It means to be delivered from a horrible circumstance. What is the horrible circumstance that we all need to be delivered from? Well, we've seen it and heard it over and over. And Romans 3.10 describes it very well. There's two parts to what we need to be delivered from. One, our spiritual condition, that we're dead spiritually. That's seen very clearly in Romans 3.10. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. This describes, ladies and gentlemen, the condition of the human soul apart from God's intervention. Second, we know... That mankind is under the judgment of God. Isaiah 6, as mentioned, describes God as holy, holy, holy. His justice therefore demands that he that sin be paid for. That every sin must be pay, paid for. Romans 1.18 says this. The wrath of God re is revealed from heaven against a little bit of ungodliness. No. All ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. This is a horrible circumstance, isn't it? This is where we are. This is the message. Listen closely that he's been teaching. He's taught a lot of this, but he hadn't given the gospel. See, we are dead in our sins. We all know it. I was watching one of the videos. It was amazing. This one young black gentleman said, I'm a sinner. I know that. So give us some hope. So I'm going to give you some hope. Do you understand, y'all, ladies and gentlemen? All of you understand that you're a sinner? That you need Jesus? That you're going to face a just God one day? That's why God, in His graciousness, sent His Son and his son lived a perfect life. Never sin, sinned once. Not one time. Not even a bad thought. He was perfect. And he's the only perfect man that's ever walked this earth. And he was 100% God and 100% man. And guess what? The amazing thing is, is that he died on a cross. And this is where the foolishness comes for many of you. Maybe think, this is foolish. He died on a cross? Yes! He died on a cross. Why? It's very clear. Romans says it. He died. He made Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf 
so that we might become the righteousness of God. Now what's that mean? It means this, that God Himself took the Son and made Him sin. What does that mean? He laid all of the sin of me, the wicked, wretched sinner, on the Son and judged the Son for my sin to appease or satisfy the wrath that I deserve. That's the message you need to hear. Your sin killed Jesus. That's the message you need to hear. Now, how are you going to respond to that? How are you going to respond to it? Oh, well, it's just another religious... No. Well, again, we go back to what we know to be true, and that is, that is God's Word, and that's where it came from. So, folks, what's it call us to do? It calls us to repent and believe in that Gospel. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed, Paul said, of the Gospel, for the Gospel is the power of God to deliver us from this bad circumstance, save us for everyone who believes. What does believe mean? Yes, believe includes a total commitment to Christ. A heart change. <coughs> Forsaking your sin and trusting in Christ alone. That's the message that you've got to embrace. And that's the gospel. Jesus died, rose from the dead, and lives. And you can live too. The greatest joy in all the world is knowing Christ, the one who died for me. Well, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Sin is breaking God's commandments. 1 John 3, 4 says, whosoever commits sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. So if you're sinning, you don't love Jesus Christ. Mike talked about knowing Jesus Christ. 1 John 2, 3, and 4 says, hereby we do know that we know God if we keep His commandments. He that says he knows God and keeps not God's commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. Now, what is salvation? Matthew chapter 1, verse 21 says, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus did not die to save you in your sin. He died to save you from your sin. From your sinning. When you save a drowning man from drowning, you get him out of the water. He's not still in the water. If he's still in the water, then he's not saved from the water. You save a man from a fire, you don't leave him in the fire. You get him out of the fire. If he's still in the fire, he's not saved. And if you're saved from sinning, uh, you're not still sinning. If you're still sinning, you're not saved. Acts chapter 3, verse 26 says, Unto you first, God, having raised up His Son Jesus, sent Him to bless you in turning away every one of you from His iniquities. Galatians 1, 4 said, He gave Himself for our sins that He might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. Uh, if you're not delivered from the power of sin, you're not going to be forgiven for the penalty of sin. James chapter 2, verse 10 says, Whosoever shall keep the whole law, yet offend in one point, he's guilty of all. If you're breaking God's law in one area, you might as well be breaking the whole thing. Jesus said in John 3, You must be born again. He said, unless a man's born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. You want to know if you're born again or not? 1 John 3, 9 says, Whosoever's born of God does not commit sin. 1 John 5, 18 says, Whosoever's born of God sinneth not. Jesus said in John 8, 11, Go and sin no more. 1 John 3, 6 says, Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. 2 Timothy 2.19 says, Let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. 1 Corinthians 15.34 says, Awake to righteousness and sin not. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8 says, He that committeth sin is of the devil. If you are committing sin, you're not saved. You're not born again. Jesus said in John 8.34, Whosoever commits sin is the servant of sin. If you're committing sin, 
You're not a servant of Jesus Christ. You're a servant of sin. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24, No man can serve two masters. You don't hate the one and love the other. He said, If you love me, keep my commandments. Romans 6, 16 says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. So you can either yield yourself to sin or you can yield yourself to righteousness. But students, you are serving the one you yield to and the one you obey. Uh, Jesus said in Mark 1.15, Repent and believe the gospel. Repentance is not apologizing, saying you're sorry or feeling bad. Repentance is forsaking all known sin. In order for you to turn to Jesus Christ, you must turn away from your sin. In order for me to turn to the back wall, I must turn away from you. In order for me to turn to you, I must turn away from the back wall. In order for you to turn to Jesus Christ, you must turn away from your sin. Acts 20:21, 20, Paul said, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus never said to come as you are. Jesus said, except you repent, you will all likewise perish. If you don't turn from all your sin and turn to Jesus Christ, you will end up in hell. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. John 15, 10. Jesus said, if you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. Nobody's abiding in the love of Jesus Christ if they're not keeping the commandments of God. That's it? 30 seconds. 30 seconds. 1 John 5, 3 says, this is the love of God that we keep His commandments. Do you love God? Are you keeping His commandments or are you sinning? Okay, it's very important that we get a concept here. He's talking about repentance as the gospel. The gospel is not repentance. Now listen closely. The gospel is not repentance. The gospel is the person and work of Jesus Christ. Repentance and faith is what we're supposed to believe in and trust in. Turn from ourself and our sin to Christ. But in order to turn to Christ, the message we should be preaching is Christ and Him crucified. This is important. The thing that breaks the heart of the sinner is recognizing your sin killed the Savior. That you are responsible. It's understanding that. Now, on top of that, He talks these verses. Most of these verses are verses concerning sanctification. There are three aspects of all salvation. And that is justification, sanctification, and glorification. Justification is to be declared right. To be declared right. How do you get this? Well, you get that by trusting in Christ alone. And then God declares you right. That's found in Romans 4. Verses 1. What then shall we say that Abraham our father according to the flesh is found? For if Abraham was justified by action, reform your life and start being good, if he was done by works, he has something to boast about. But not before God. For what does Scripture say? Abraham believed God. Believed God. Trusted completely in God. And it was credited to him as righteousness. That means that God declares us right. When we forsake our sin and turn to Christ and embrace the cross and embrace Jesus, God says, you're right with me. You're righteous. And it's not because of what you did. It's not you. It's faith in what Christ did and who he is, what he's done. Otherwise, we could all boast and say, I did it! I cleaned myself up! I'm a good man! That's what the passage is saying. Abraham, what? Believed in God. <coughs> Trusted in Christ. Trusted in God as He had been revealed. Justification. 
Romans 5, 1 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. He's talking all about the second step, sanctification. He's never talking about justification. And by the way, I want to let you know, you will never be sanctified unless you're justified. Unless you know that you're right with God, you're not going to love the God that saved you. Do you understand? You've got to be right with God first. And then you want to obey Him. And He will deliver you from your sin, as we know from Romans 6, 7, and 8. It's all through it. And He can quote all these verses from that. Read your Bible tonight. Can't get through them all. But folks, it's direction, not perfection. Now listen, it's direction, not perfection. How do we know this? We know this from Romans. Romans 7 says, I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. That's Paul talking in Romans 7, which is in the middle of the sanctification section of Romans. Romans is the gospel. It's the part about now God, after turning and trusting in Christ, now God's setting me apart. But I'm battling my mortal body, my old man. I'm putting it to death constantly. As he says in Romans 8, Otherwise, by the way, if we're completely free from sin, why is there any commandments in the New Testament? Why tell us to stop doing something if we wouldn't do it? Obviously. Confess your sins one to another. Why? Right? What does that mean? Confess your sins. Sanctification. All right. You know, Mike talks a lot about this being for disciples, and but the Bible doesn't say anything about that. I'll quote this to you again. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8 says, He that committed sin is of the devil. 1 John 3, 9 doesn't say a mature Christian, a disciple, says, Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. 1 John 5, 18 says, Whosoever is born of God sinneth not. John 8, 34, Jesus said, Whosoever commits sin is the servant of sin. And nobody's talking here about being saved by what you do. I am preaching, and what I preach is that repentance is a condition of salvation. It's what I've always preached. You're not going to be saved unless you turn from your sin. And most of the time, uh, in, in most people in America, including Mike, just gloss right over that. They don't put any emphasis on it. To where, to where people really understand it. Mark chapter 1 verse 15 says, Repent and believe the gospel. Repentance comes before believing. Acts 20, 21 says, Testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance come first. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 1 said, uh, says, Repentance from dead works and faith towards God. Now, faith without works is dead. Yes, you're saved by faith. Somebody said, you're saved by faith and faith alone, but the faith that saves is never alone. Faith without works is dead. Acts 15, 9 says that their hearts were purified by faith. Real faith in Jesus Christ will purify your heart. And if your heart's pure, your life will be pure. Romans chapter 3, verse 31 says, Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. So your faith in Jesus Christ doesn't make God's law void. It causes God's law to be established in your life. Galatians chapter 5 verse 6 says that faith worketh by love. What is love? 1 John 5 3. This is the love of God that we keep His commandments. So the faith that saves is a faith that works by love. And love is keeping the commandments of God. Uh, 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 and 5 says, Whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. How do you overcome the world? Whosoever is, whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. Not just a mature Christian. Whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. What's the world? 1 John 2.15 
Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. A faith that, over, a faith that saves is a faith that overcomes the world. Uh, the Bible says in Hebrews 12, 14, and I remind you that God is not a liar. God means what He says. God intended us to understand the Bible. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Holiness is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbors yourself. You cannot love God and your neighbors yourself with all your heart and sin against Him at the same time. Uh, the, <clears throat> the Bible said in Hebrew, uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15 and 16 said, Be holy as God is holy. It doesn't say try. It's a commandment. Matthew 5, 48, Jesus said, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. That's a commandment. What's the perfection He's talking about? The perfection of holiness. The perfection of loving God with all. And if God says all, He means all. That's what He commands. That's what He expects. That's what God requires. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. How, how much time? Uh, about 45 seconds. Okay. <clears throat> so, you know, the Bible's clear, uh, students. It's a holy God. He's not going to command you to do something you're not capable of. Jesus said, uh, Jesus said, your sinful eye and your sinful hand and your sinful foot will get you sent to hell. It's better to go through life, halt, rather than to go to hell with two eyes, with two hands and two feet. Oh, all right. <coughs> We're almost done. This is the last section of questions, and we will take your questions, right? Ready? Yes. Have you been justified? Yes, sir. Okay, do, give me a definition of justified. Uh, justified means to be counted as if you hadn't sinned. Okay. So you've been declared righteous by God. Yes. What did you can, I, can I give you a verse? Okay, Romans chapter 3, verse 25 says, Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. I'm only made righteous based on my past sins that I've repented of. Yes, God made a provision for it. But I'm not made righteous if I'm sinning presently. Okay, so you're... The, thanks for giving me the next question. So if you sinned after you had that moment of conversion, Isaiah 6 moment, as you described in the one interview, if you sin then, who pays for that sin? Well, Jesus made a provision for it. Did He pay for the sin? Yes, He did. He paid for sin. He, he made a provision for all sin. Even after you... He made a provision for it, but God's forgiveness is always conditional. Jesus, Proverbs 28, 13 says, He that covers his sin shall not prosper, but whoso confesses and forsakes them shall have mercy. You want God to have mercy on you? You must not only confess your sins, you must forsake your sins. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, Jesus, uh, 1 John 1, 7 says, If we walk in the light... As He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanses us okay. from all sin. So in order to have the blood of Jesus cleanse you from all your sin, you've got to walk in the light. You've got to walk in obedience. If you're not walking in the light, if you're not walking in obedience, then the blood of Jesus does not cleanse you of your sin. Okay, so back to the question. What, what did you have to do to justify yourself? Well, in order, to, in order to accept the provision of Jesus Christ, I had to meet the conditions. There are conditions to salvation, one of which is repentance, as I've already made clear. Okay, so your repentance is what ultimately you had to do in order to get God to pay for your sin. No, Jesus paid for all of our sin. So, well, is everybody so going to heaven? Uh, is everybody saved? No, I didn't ask that. Are we well, if, if Jesus paid for all of our sins, we don't have to do anything. We don't have to accept it. We don't have to meet the conditions. Then according to what you're saying is, we all automatically got a free ticket to heaven. Okay, so when you started cleaning your life up, when you turned and started obeying, that's when you were... Repentance cleaning. is not a process. Okay. It's not what a process. Is what is it? 
Uh, I thought I made it clear. It's a change of heart, change of mind, change Did of lifestyle. Change your heart? It's a change wait, wait, wait. of your ultimate wait. intention. Did you change your own heart? I yielded to the Spirit of God. I had a part in it under the influence. Yes. At Romans chapter, so glad you asked. Romans chapter 6, verse 17 says, Though you were the uh, said Romans chapter 6, verse 17 says, Though you were the servants of sin, you have you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. So yes. You, so you yes, you must yield. You can resist the Holy Ghost. That's why Acts 7.51 says, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. So i got verses like, Grieve not the Spirit, quench not the Spirit. Yes, we can resist. We've got to yield. So can you lose your right standing with God? Absolutely. James chapter 5, verse 19 and 20. Never had a Calvinist be able to answer this. James chapter 5, verse 19. Maybe you'll be the first. You didn't answer it the other day. James chapter 5, verse 19 and 20 says, Brethren, if any of you do err from the faith, and one convert him, let him know that he which converts the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. Number one, he's writing to who? Brethren. Not sinners. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth. The error means to turn away from, to fall away from. You can't turn away or fall away from something that you were never a part of. Who's the truth? Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to Father but by me. Can you depart from God? Yes, you can, because just like he said, we wouldn't be warned not to sin unless it was possible for us to sin. And God wouldn't warn us not to depart from God if it was... Uh, I don't believe in this constitutional regeneration that you believe in. I didn't say constitutional regeneration. I just said, do you believe in regeneration? Yeah, regeneration is when you turn from living your life for yourself to turn to living your life to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbors yourself. That's what regeneration is. Can I go back and do? No. <laughs> Can I do my questions? <laughs> well, I'm sorry. Listen, no, if, go ahead. If you find me, do you want to do one no, more? No, 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 no. Go ahead. Go ahead. Your question. I'm sorry. I took a while. I mean, no, I, you did fine. Okay. No, 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 I didn't no, mean no, that. I understand your, your I didn't mean that. Your frustration I didn't mean that. With that. No, 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 I didn't think. I, think I want to go back and answer some of the questions that I asked you. <laughs> okay, okay uh, Mike, do you sin? Do I sin? Yes. Yes, I sin. Okay, what kind of sinner are you? What kind of sinner am I? Uh, oh, wretched man that I am, as Paul would say. That's me. Well, okay. Uh, are, are you a rapist? Uh, oh, yes. No. <laughs> uh, well, depends on if you define it the way Jesus did or the way I do. If you so define you... it as the way Jesus did, he said if you get angry with your brother, you've committed murder in your heart. So, well, if you ask me if I got angry in the last week, I have to admit I've gotten angry. Well, it says without a cause. The Bible says God is angry with the wicked every day. The Bible said be angry and sin not. No, no, I got angry because, I'll, I'll confess it right here, I got angry because I didn't get my way. And it right. was sin. It was sin. Okay. So you've got murder in your heart. Yeah. Okay, the Bible said... Uh, Whosoever hates but I you. repented of that. Bible said, and I was already declared righteous at justification. And God put that sin to death, and I'm learning and growing and putting it to death daily. Mike, what I want to ask is, how little do you have to repent to become a Christian? How, what, what level of repentance does God accept? 30%? 40%? Fifty percent. Okay. How little can you repent and still be acceptable to God? Forsaking your sin is forsaking everything that you know that's all about you and turning and trusting in Christ. Now, after you become a believer, the Word of God is preached to you. You start to realize, whoa, there's more things that have to go, and that has to go, and that has to go, and that has to go. If you're a genuine believer, your heart will be changed by God. Not because I can form my heart and form my heart. It, regeneration is literally regenerate. God does it. Born of God. God gave me a new heart. And now, He's in the process, with the Spirit that lives within me, putting to death that sin in my life. It's a daily battle. Are you free from sin? 
Yes, I'm free with, from sin. Okay, so how do you sin if you're free? How do you keep sinning? That's a great question. In Romans 6, when he's talking about free from sin, he means that he is no longer, we're no longer, a genuine believer is no longer in bondage to sin. I'm no longer stuck in it and I can't get out of it. The unbeliever is stuck in the sin. Now you might be here and you might be one of those that hasn't repented yet. And you haven't trusted in Christ, the one who died on the cross for you and rose from the dead. But you can be free from that bondage of sin. If you will commit your life to Christ, trust Him, the one who died in your place. What did Jesus mean when He said, Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone that says to Me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of My Father which is in heaven. Man, I wish somebody would ask that to me when I'm up on the pulpit on Sunday morning. I love that. That's a beautiful one. Let me tell you. What it means is, is that people have a wrong view of Jesus. They make Jesus in their own mind. They have false gods. They may even call him Jesus. And they say, I forsake my sin and I trust in well, this Jesus they, that says does this. Lord. But listen, when they get there, what is, what did Lord they'll say, mean? Lord, Lord. What did Lord mean in that in that context of the society it was written in? They didn't live in, you know, like ours. Well, they had many, many gods. I mean, tons and tons of gods. He was the Jews? What are you speaking to? Not the Jews. What was he, the, the the what was he talking to in Matthew the 7? What was he talking to in Matthew 7? The Jews. Okay. So don't. don't okay. Yeah. So what you, the reality behind that statement is, is that not everybody's heart's converted. Not everybody has a genuine repentance and trust in Christ. And when they don't really have a conversion, guess what you get? Hypocrisy. Now, and let me ask you a question, ladies and gentlemen. Is some of what he says about the Christians on the campus true? Listen closely. Be careful, folks. Be careful. There's three people in this room. There's three types of people in this room. There's one, those who have not believed and think, man, I've got to come listen to Mike and maybe argue with him, and this is going to be great. And you're here, and you're hearing about the gospel, and you're going, wow, this is the first time I've heard this. You're not there yet. You haven't repented and trusted in Christ. Then there's some that are here in name only. In other words, they've been going to a church all their life, maybe. On and off. They get away from college, and they say, oh, let's party. Let's have a good time. Jesus isn't really the one that died for my sin. He's not important to me. Heart wasn't really converted. And those need to take the words of 2 Corinthians that says examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. Mark. But then there's the third. The third would be those that are genuine believers that are grappling in their soul. I'm not perfect! And I know my hope is not found in me. It's found in Jesus Christ, the one who died for me. It's not in what I do. It's what He did. For you, I say, study your Bible and talk against it. Kindly. Gently. And I would suggest to you, don't argue with Him when He's out there preaching. Go up to Him afterwards. He'll have a good talk with you. We have great talks. One more question. But, but go around and talk to the people while he's preaching to them and give them the hope of the gospel. You know, this this whole idea of you're saying that you, it's impossible to resist the Holy Ghost. So why does the Bible say we can do that? Why does the Bible say in Acts 2.40, save yourselves from this untoward generation? Why does Stephen say what he said? You stiff-necked and uncircumcised and hard ears, you always resist the Holy Ghost. As your father just said, what about Romans 6.17 that I, mean, I never get any answers for these scriptures that I'm bringing up. Uh, but th but uh, thanks be to God, though you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed. You have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered. Is repentance something God does for you? Or is repentance something you do? Okay. Ultimately, the question is: is that all, uh, God works in our heart, and we do it? Then we literally choose to forsake. And trust. And that's the same Christ. thing I'm saying. No, you're saying yes, something different. Okay. You're saying that you do it. You reform your heart, and you do all these things, and you use the words "do." I did this to be justified. 
How am I justified? How am I declared righteous? By trusting in what Christ did, not who, what I do. Who's trusting in Christ? Who's trusting in Christ? Yeah, who's exercising the faith? Everybody that's a genuine believer. Okay. okay. And I would agree, sanctification, you should live out your faith. Look, I'm not saying that sanctification doesn't happen. I'm just telling you that without that justification, <laughs> without justification being declared right, you aren't going to be sanctified. You ain't gonna you ain't gonna change your life. Sanctification means holiness, and without holiness no man will see the Lord. <laughs> great, great, thank you. Thank you for this. I appreciate you. Let's give him a hand. We're gonna take a, about a ten minute break. Um, and during that time you can uh, Give me your questions and drop them on this table right here, and I'll ask them of our debaters in just a minute. We tried to, since we had a limited time, we tried to select some of the best questions, but there's just so much. I'm just going to start going through that. So, uh, the first one to Brother Micah. Uh, I've been to many of your sessions, and you are always talking about religion. I'm interested to hear more about you. What is well, your backward? I won't be able to answer that just one. Just answer yeah. a little bit. Just briefly, then. Yeah, briefly. Background. An upbringing, uh, hobbies, interests. Well, I grew up. I grew up mainly in Miami in a non-religious home. Uh, I was a powerlifter. Uh, I, I benched over 400 before I graduated high school. Played ball. I wasn't a Christian or anything. I competed in powerlifting for a while, and I got. Uh, well, I can't say I got saved. Thought I got saved. And then uh, went to college. Started. I taught school a while before I started doing this. My hobby is reading. Uh, I don't really have a whole lot of hobbies because I think time is so valuable. Uh, I enjoy spending time with my wife. I enjoy praying, reading the Bible, and reading Christian books and seeking. But I, I mostly just read the Bible. This is a question for both of you. What is your opinion on the state state of Israel in regards to Christ's return and Old Testament prophecy? That is, how does Old Testament prophecy in Israel relate to what is happening today? Yes. Um, I'll give you a first stab. Uh, we don't know. Here's the deal. God has planned for Israel based on Genesis 3, or uh, Genesis 15, and all the promises he made to Abraham. But we don't know whether it's coming soon that he's going to reestablish Israel and the tribulation is going to happen and the wrath of God is going to be poured out on the world. We don't know. Uh, Israel could be coming together for that or they could be completely disbanded and come back a thousand years from now and be reunited and God could bring it about. But I believe that God does have a plan for Israel based on the promises that he made to Abraham. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I'm not, a, I'm not uh, I don't believe the church has replaced Israel. I believe God has a plan for Israel. And I believe it we are going to see all the world come against Israel because the Bible talks about that. So. Jesus said, Whosoever believeth in me shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Micah, what is your response to this? Well, whosoever believes, you know, belief is not mental assent. You know, like we've said tonight, belief is trust and faith. And I thought I covered pretty well what real faith is. Faith purifies the heart, works by love, establishes the law, and overcomes the world. You know, Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. So, you know, just because somebody believes that Jesus is Lord and calls him Lord doesn't mean they're going to heaven. Uh, if he's your Lord, you obey him and you do what he says. And if you don't do what he says and you don't obey him, then you're not going to heaven. Hebrews 5.9 says that Jesus is the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Okay, read the verse again. Can I see that shot on you? Yeah. Whosoever believeth in me shall not perish, but have everlasting life. The key term in there is me. And it's not me. It's Christ. <clears throat> The object of your complete trust and commitment must be Christ. And that verse talks about the glory of Christ and by trusting in Him, you can have eternal life. Genuine trust does evidence itself by works, 
but it's about Christ. It's not about me. I like the comment. Yeah. You know, I, I think lots of times people get a misunderstanding and people talk so much about the gift uh, but of everlasting life. And I'm not saying that you're saying this, but Jesus, Jesus is the gift. You know, 1 John 5, 12, He that has the Son has life. He that has not the Son of God has not life. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. So, in John 17, 3, says, This is life eternal, that they might know Thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom Thou hast sent. So, eternal life is knowing Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus is the gift. You depart from Jesus, then you don't have the gift. Uh, I believe this is a question directed towards Mike. If you can sin and go to heaven, how do you get to hell? <laughs> okay, I gotta go all the way back to it. Let's do it again. Ready? Right, listen close. Everybody is born a sinner. We're all sinners headed for hell. We're on a collision course for the wrath of God. If we repent and trust in the one who died in our place and rose from the dead, we are declared right. And directionally, He is our Lord and we follow Him. If you don't repent and trust in Christ, the one who died on the cross and rose from the dead, then you will go to hell. Not because I'm going to send you there and not because of anything I say, unless it lines up with this. Because God's Word says it. If Christ isn't your Lord, that's where you're going. If you haven't trusted in Christ the Savior, the one who died in your place, that's where you're going. For the both of you, uh, what brings on repentance? Mm, good question. <laughs> well, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 7.10, For godly sorrow works repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. So, salvation is preceded by repentance, and repentance is preceded by godly sorrow. Godly sorrow involves guilt. And so, you know, so old Brother Mike is making us feel bad. Yeah, I want you to feel bad about your sinning against God. I want you to feel guilty about your sinning. You can't get saved uh, without repentance. You can't repent without godly sorrow. Uh, and John, John 16, 8 says, When He has come, the He there is referring to God, uh, the Holy Ghost, the third person of Godhead. When He has come... He will reprove the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And that's King James, but the word reprove is what a lot of people use uh, for the word convict. And to be convicted means to be convinced that you're condemned. And that that's the first step of repentance. I would just add that seeing the cross and knowing what Christ did brings on repentance too. The gospel includes... The power again, it's Romans 1.16. The power of God, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The gospel. That includes our condemnation, needing a savior, and Jesus, who is I'm going to who we will exalt, and his resurrection. That gospel message is what brings on repentance. I would, and God convicts with the Holy Spirit. I would agree that once uh, a guilty sinner sees the cross, that'll that'll also bring on conviction. Can I ask a question? Now, Finney said, Finney said, <laughs> Can I ask your, a... your favorite theologian, Finney said, if, if you find a if you find a convicted if you find a convicted sinner convert him, if you find an unconvicted sinner convict him. So we've got to convict people before we can get them converted. Not a whole lot of... Do you want me to dialogue with you? We've got a number of questions. Okay. <laughs> if you don't mind. I think the Word convicts. And I think the Holy Spirit takes the Word and convicts. I just want to throw myself out of that completely. I'm not going to sit here and go, I'm going to look into your heart. You're a sinner. I'm going to say the Bible says you're a sinner. The Bible says this. I'm going to use the Bible. I'm going to try to get me out of it because it's really not about what I think. It's what it says. Yeah. That would be the only thing I would add. Without you, there won't be any preaching now. Okay. 
to the both of you again. In general, how do people approach you at, uh, at the end of your preaching sessions? Well, it varies. <laughs> uh, some days at the end of the preaching session, you have real good conversations. And other days, uh, so I, I usually try to, after I finish preaching, I usually try to sit down because I think that's less aggressive and less combative. Uh, and sometimes that'll work on settling the crowd down, uh, but sometimes it doesn't. But I found that the more I preach on a campus, the more the students get to know me, the more they get used to the preaching, uh, the more civil they become. And, you know, like I preach at UCF quite a bit. And at UCF, people will come out, sit, listen, ask good questions. And, you know, it's not, you know, it's, it's not a hostile environment. Lots of, same thing at University of North Florida. But in order to get the campus to that point, it's like breaking a horse. Uh, you you, you, you got to... You gotta get on the horse. You gotta you gotta ride him until he breaks, until he settles down. And uh, I haven't I don't feel like I've been able to break this campus yet the way I want to. But this campus this campus is unusual. Uh, my wife and I were talking. A lot of a lot of strongholds on this on this campus that you don't have in other places. <laughs> Do I answer that, Um Well, sometimes, you know, when I finish preaching, I have people come up and say, oh, that's a great message. Those are the ones that I'm a little leery of. Uh, when somebody comes up to me and says, man, God's word is good. Christ is wonderful. Man, I'm a sinner. Those are the ones that I absolutely Keep preaching the word. That's what I like to do. I get it occasionally. <laughs> to the both of you again, when was the last time or how often are you moved to tears during your preaching over the lost in the crowd? Well, I'll go first. I would suggest today we need to be careful of using emotion to try to persuade people. And so as a pastor and as a preacher, I think it's very important that I be careful of letting my tears show. Um, now, if you want to know if I've cried over a sinner, I did yesterday. But I don't think that it's the place when I'm preaching the word to just use emotion, because it can be a powerful I didn't mean emotion. I meant tears, tears as in God, you know, a godly sorrow over. Oh, yeah. well, I didn't mean emotion. Like honestly, that. that's why I'm here. The sorrow drove me here. That's why I'm doing this. Joe, uh, Whitfield said, if, "If they can't see your tears, let them hear your tears." That's what, what you're saying. Uh, my wife can cry on a dime. My wife cries about every time she testifies, and uh, she's real emotional. Uh, I'm not real emotional, and I don't think that I think that love is not necessarily an emotion. Which, you know, I I wish uh, that I that I'd weep more for the loss. But now, the Bible said in First John three eighteen, little children, let us not love in word or tongue, but in deed and truth. And so, you know, you can love in word and tongue, but not not love and deed and truth. Love is an action. and uh, But I, I do pray fervently uh, for the lost all the time. I mean, that's, why I, that's why I gave up everything I had. I mean, this is not a financially rewarding uh, career that I'm in here. You know, I mean, I, I owned a house. I was a, I was a school teacher. I was uh, stable. You know, I had comfort and security and all that. And I gave all that up. And... Uh, <clears throat> But, but you know that's at the same time though that that shouldn't be an excuse. I don't think that I don't think that uh, men of God today pray like they used to. You know, I, I think that, and I think that's why they had more results. Uh, sometimes after <coughs> repenting of sins to God, I still feel bad or guilty. What may solve this? This is a question for the both of you. Well, 
obviously the question would be is, is if you really repent, the end of repentance is peace with God. There's joy. There's joy at the cross, ladies and gentlemen. The person that asked that, I would suggest to you, you need to know the cross again, even after being a believer. See, look, when I sin and I grieve, there's hope. <laughs> and by his grace I put that to death and I don't do it again so I would suggest you got to be careful if you have godly sorrow or you say it's repenting just because you're feeling bad it's not really godly sorrow it's not from God it would be something like you're just kind of oh I feel bad I did this I don't want the consequences <clears throat> That to realize that Christ was killed for that sin. You know, I heard somebody say once that they point out the fact that before Jesus went to the cross, he went to Gethsemane. And I think sometimes we got to be careful about going to the cross too soon without going through Gethsemane. Uh, because the, the, the grief and the sorrow and the anguish that you feel for sinning against God. Uh, lots of times that will work as a preventative to keep you from going in that direction again. And just to further clarify what Mike said, 1 John chapter 3, verse 20 and 21 said, For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. So if your heart's condemning you, uh, then it, like... Mike says it's a good chance you haven't repented. You might just feel bad. There's a, I didn't quote the whole verse, but the Bible said in 2 Corinthians 7.10, Godly sorrow works repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world work at death. There is a sorrow that's not a godly sorrow, and it works death. It's a selfish, you know, uh, sorrow because you got caught, sorrow because you feel bad, sorrow because uh, you believe it's going to send you to hell, sorrow because... Uh, uh, you wasted time and money and, and all that. And I mean, all that's a part of it, but it's still selfish. Uh, so, you know, I, the, the, the Bible says, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so if we don't have peace with God, uh, if our hearts, there's no peace there, if our hearts condemning us, we don't have confidence toward God, we've got to ask ourselves, are we right with God? The Bible says in Hebrews 12, 17, that Esau found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Now he saw it try to repent, find, get right with God, and he couldn't do it. Do you believe Paul was a Christian? Yes. <laughs> well, that was this is a Roman 7 kind. Not much, not much debate there. Well, I think what they're saying is they're talking about Paul, Romans 7, and we this take a long time. But see, I believe, I'll quote a one. First off, we would dip, he believes that Paul was writing about his post conversion experience, and I believe Paul was writing about his pre conversion experience. Paul said in Romans 7 7, I had not known sin but by the law. I had not known lust except the law and said, Thou shalt not covet. Now, Paul's a mature Christian. He didn't know what sin was. Of course he did. Paul wrote 1 Thessalonians, and I'll, I'll stop after this verse. 1 Thess Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10. Paul said, You are witnesses in God also, how holy, justly, and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. So Paul said that God as His witness, His behavior, His lifestyle, His actions, His deeds before God was holy, just, and unblameable. Paul wasn't running around sinning every day in word, thought, and deed. Paul said in Romans 7, Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay, now if we stop there, he would have a really good argument for it being before. But there's a lot more, and this says it. Yeah, Romans 8. So then, no. Oh. Romans 7.25, B, second half of B. So then, on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other, with my flesh, the law of sin. Which implies that it, 
Now, see, now he jumps back. No, I thanks never jumped back. I never jumped back. Well, then thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That Wait. Conversion. That's conversion. So uh, you got to, he's there. He, okay. he wouldn't know that Jesus Christ all, is his Lord if he wasn't converted. All through, yeah, he says, thanks be to God, Jesus delivered me from this body of death. He's talking about the struggle uh, of somebody that's convicted of their sin. Paul grew up as a Jew under Jewish law. The whole purpose of Romans 7 is to show you that you can't get saved by keeping the law. Well, we could argue this one until the end of the, the millennium. Well, if you if you take Romans 7, uh, it, Paul <laughs> contradicts everything he said in Romans 6 and Romans 8 if you exactly. take that view. Okay. Just remember that. Okay. Pastor Mike disagrees. Go ahead. Anything to the question? Huh? Question. What, is, what is it? Do you think that sanctification is a process or does it immediately come with justification? Both. Yeah. Huh? Both. <laughs> Wait a second. You can't answer that way. Of course I can. No. Of course no, I can. no, no, wait, 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 wait. Of course I can. We are set apart by God. There is two aspects of sanctification. That is, when we become a believer, we are sanctified, set apart by God. But there's a second aspect of sanctification, which is the process, which means that you are putting to death sin in your life. But if you say that you're perfect and you don't sin anymore, then you've already been sanctified. So that's not a process. Okay. Can I? Good. Can I answer? Okay. Okay. Uh, when you're when you're born again, when you're saved, you're you're sanctified. Okay. You have to turn from all sin. Now I can have three people working for me. Okay. They've all got different levels of experience different levels of ability. Uh, I don't expect the same performance out of all three of them, but I expect the same commitment. The same commitment, uh, the commitment's the same for any believer, no matter how long, whether you've been saved one day or 50 years, to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbors yourself. Yes, I believe that there's a, a growth process. The Bible says, Second Peter 3.18, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You know, the more... The more I come to know the Lord, uh, the, the more clearly I see Him, the more I'm going to grow. And so I believe in uh, growing in sanctification. But see, I don't believe in this gradually stopping sinning. You know, sin is something that you know. It's not something you... you know, Paul, James 4.17 says, Therefore to him that knows to do good, and doeth it not to him it's sin. That's the definition of grace. Grace? Well, there's a lot of definitions. Grace is ultimately unmerited favor from God, right? Growing grace, growing unmerited right. favor from God. That's right. Why would it be unmerited unless it did something bad? Well, Titus 2, 11 and 12 says did this. Did you catch that? I got shut off. Uh, well, I got shut off. Did you hear? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Did you hear? So the growing in grace is included in the process of putting to death sin. It's that process of putting to death sin continuously. Can I respond? Yeah. Romans, Romans 6, 14, Paul said, for sin shall not have dominion over you. For you're not under the law, but under grace. The grace that saves you from sin is the grace that gives you power to live above sin. Titus 2, 11 and 12 says this, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. So, I'd like to add something, but that's okay. Returning to the Apostle Paul, uh, it said that he said that he dies every day in his sins in order to wake up a good Christian. How do the both of you interpret this? Can, can I answer? Yeah, go ahead. I believe what they're talking about there is 1 Corinthians 15, 31, where Paul said, I die daily. The whole context there is he's talking about the resurrection. And Paul is not talking about putting to death I mean, I could see where, yes, you daily you make a decision uh, to, to love God and serve God to take up your cross and follow Him. Okay? Uh, but that, but what the context he's talking about there, he's talking about putting his body on the line. He's talking about putting himself in danger for the sake of the God. He says, I fought with beasts at Ephesus. He says, uh, 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 let us eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Uh, be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. So that's the context of 1 Corinthians 15.31. He's not talking about 
you know, daily, I, you know, all the time I'm sinning, so I need to stop. No, I, well, okay. well, that's the context of it. Go ahead. I would say it's the, it, it, it includes mortification of your flesh and, and your body. Well, taking up your cross, I agree with that. It's that's putting part to death of, sinful tendencies. Putting, putting your life daily on the line uh, for the sake of Jesus Christ would be a cross. Okay, again, and, and I would like to... I would say Romans 8, 12, 13 says this, So then, brother, this is in the sanctification section of Romans. So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. But if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are present tense, putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Right, if you're putting it's a to death. process of putting to death the deeds of the body. If you're putting, ongoing process. If you're, if the Bible says in Galatians five sixteen, this I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Romans eight two. Command, walk in the Spirit. That's right. So you're not going to be sinning if you're walking in the Spirit. Romans eight four that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. Okay. And I apologize, but we're out of time. <laughs> <laughs>